Hello and welcome back to In the Envelope, an awards podcast. I am, as always, your host, Jack Smart, the awards editor at Backstage, your guide to the acting industry and the most trusted name in casting. We are here to give you a behind-the-scenes look at some of the buzziest contenders for the small screen's biggest trophy, the Emmy Award. This season of In the Envelope is brought to you by HBO. I always say that to be an actor is to accept that you are capable of anything, good or bad. You have to acknowledge that possibility in yourself and therefore, you know, accept the possibility of any circumstance that could happen to you. Hello, Jamie, and happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind. Um, you, you had a lovely birthday, you were saying? Yeah, it was a quiet one. It's in quiet. I'm, um, how old am I? 35 now, so I'm getting on a bit. 35? Uh, 35 years on this planet, yeah. and um, That's excellent. I was never a real party animal, so this is... <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah. You, you gotta get. You got to do what you want on yeah. your day. Slippers and a nice cup of tea. Oh, that sounds lovely. I think that's what I'm going to be doing all weekend. And Emmy-nominated TV, of course. <laughs> ah, yes. Oh, in fact, I wanted to check in with you. I wanted to ask, what TV have you been watching? Because we last talked about that on the podcast, like, what, episode one? And um, it's a lot that's premiered since. Yes, well, I have been catching up on season two of Better Call Saul, so mm. it's a little old now. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, Game of Thrones. <gasps> Yes. Which we yes. may or may not want to talk about based on the fact that it's not nominated this year. True. It's not Emmy eligible, uh, which makes it fun viewing because it's, <laughs> I can't rationalize like dropping everything to watch Game of Thrones right now because uh, it's not directly relevant to my work covering Emmy nominated shows. Oh, it's 45 minutes a week. I'm sure you'll. Uh, it's you not for me because I then have to go on the internet and read every single <laughs> word <written about laughs> every episode. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm yeah. coming out as a Game of Thrones nerd. I mean, it's not that weird of a thing to be a Game of Thrones nerd anymore, is it? No, it's, it's pretty mainstream. the biggest show on television. I'm watching Fargo, or I actually finished Fargo season three of Noah Hawley's riff on the Coen brothers, which is truly, truly compelling TV. That quirky, dark, mm. not knowing what's going to come next vibe totally works yes. for me. <laughs> well, in fact, this season is very much about, it's a little bit of about the the theme is like coincidences and the oh. randomness of the universe and how there's sometimes a poetic justice or like a poetic narrative as we try to make sense of the world but often there's not mm. and there's just random soulless consequences and of course violence and blood yeah i keep thinking about it it's such a great show my problem is i start a show get halfway through mm -hmm. it and then get distracted by a new show and watch a lot of shows halfway through. <laughs> oh, you have ADD. Yeah, that's that's my ADD, problem. ADD. So yeah. I, you talk about Fargo too much and I'll just abandon all my current shows and start watching that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Okay. So who do we have today? Who's on the podcast today? Well, speaking of Fargo, mm. uh, season three specifically, we have Carrie Coon on the podcast today, which for those of us who are fans of her, like not a lot of people may know who she is just yet. But for those of us who have watched her on stage and on screen, we know that she is truly one of the greatest working actors today. Yeah. Um, for anyone who's seen season three of Fargo, they understand. For anyone who's seen HBO's The Leftovers, they understand. She is the star of that show, um, that criminally underrated show, yeah. um, which we did get into in this interview. We talked about both of those things. And we talked a lot about um, the practicalities of being a working actor, especially at the beginning of your career. Yeah, she was talking about financial practicalities, uh, you yeah. know, life skills, learning to cook, things like that, which it, it's not the sexy stuff, but it's, mm. it's stuff that's really going to make or break you, I think. That's right. And she is so grounded. And in fact, I, I hope it comes through. I'm sure it will come through listening in. But I had a headache on the day of this interview mm. before and after the she walked into the room. I mean, it was total zen. It was total chill. She's such a superb listener. We talked a lot about the art of listening. This is a great podcast to, episode to listen to, like in a quiet space, with your eyes closed, yeah. just like being mindful. 
Yeah, we'll be uh, back at the end of the episode. But uh, until then, I think we should get to it. Yeah, I think so. All right. Let's take a short break and then go to our interview with Carrie Coon. This episode is brought to you by HBO's original limited series, The Night Of, which delves into the intricate story of a fictitious murder case in New York City, examining the police investigation, the criminal justice system, and the purgatory of Rikers Island, where the accused awaits his trial. The Washington Post raves, John Turturro and Riz Ahmed shine. For your Emmy consideration in outstanding limited series and all other categories. Carrie Coon is a theater-trained actor who got her start in regional and repertory theater before starring in the 2012 revival of Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf on Broadway, for which she was nominated a Tony Award. Screen audiences may know her from her feature film debut, David Fincher's Gone Girl, opposite Ben Affleck, and for HBO's The Leftovers, where she plays Nora Durst. She is now Emmy-nominated for her role in FX's third season of Noah Hawley's Fargo. Here it is, my chat with Carrie Coon. I had a really great voice teacher. I mm. had a really get, great mentor who was a director, mm-hmm. who always told me I'd work in TV and film, actually, which I never thought I would do. But no, um, you were always stage, stage, stage. No, oh, totally, yeah. for years. But a great voice teacher. The voice work was really the thing that I found most mm. interesting from a psychological standpoint That's in my cool. own sort of development as yeah. a human being. Okay. And I, I went off to the Roy Hart Theater in France for a summer program, and I watched all these women who were lay people they were teachers and novelists and housewives and they were doing this voice mm. training and i watched them go from being quiet and mousy and oh wow having no confidence to just just transform open completely open open chest screaming filling a room it was astonishing because it's all about the voice mm-hmm. and and we're so trapped in our bodies this, this country is very particularly bad ah. I mean, everyone's sticking their necks out mm. you know very disconnected from our bodies Interesting. And a very puritanical culture, really. I mean, we're quite repressed sexually. And oh, and that's part of it. Mm-hmm, most <sighs> definitely. How interesting. Does that have to do with the fi- with the on-camera stuff? The- oh, yes. Okay. I mean, I think... Because um, often if you're in a close-up, you can't really move. No, and, and if you don't have any vocal ease, you're going to be straining. Mm, and gotcha. also, mm, you just don't have enough... You don't have an opportunity to create vocal variety. You don't have a chance yeah. to make choices about your voice. So. Ooh, okay. You know, you hear actors, a lot of young actors nowadays with their, you know, like their little vo- vocal Your fry vocal voice. Fry, yeah. And they're like, that's all they can do. Uh-huh. And that you're not connected to your, it's all up in your throat. Right. There's nothing There's no centered yeah. about it. So you can never drop in. And I don't know how mm. anybody connects to their body emotionally without it, without breathing. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's why singers, I mean, it's so important for you to be connected with your breath mm-hmm. as a singer, of course. But actors who don't study that. I think it's a real disservice. And you're saying the neck is strained. Yeah, people don't sit up straight. If you don't sit breathing. up straight, you don't have a, you don't have a column from your, yeah, you know, mm. your mouth to your diaphragm yeah. to your, your hoo hoo. Yeah, you got to breathe from <laughs> your hoo hoo, girls. You do. Excellent. Well, that's, that's we're off to a great start with the acting advice. <laughs> 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 breathe from your hoo hoo. You heard it here first. Um, you <laughs> said a really interesting thing in your backstage magazine cover story. Oh, did I? Uh, about kind of, you were talking about the sort of differences between acting for the stage and acting Mm -hmm. for the screen, and you said that you will continue to go back to the stage, uh, of Mm -hmm. course, and that's kind of where you came from and where you're always going to go back to, because um, on film and TV, you're waiting for someone else to tell you that you got the the Mm -hmm. take or the moment, and in theater, it's mostly up to you, or Mm -hmm. it's all about you're kind of engaging that in yes. rehearsals and in performances. And so you don't want to get complacent, right? And Yeah, and lose touch to with my own mm-hmm. arbiter of taste, I think would be a wouldn't wouldn't make me a stronger artist, certainly. Yeah. And when you're when you're tailoring your performance to somebody else's approval, then you're not really mm. making choices, I don't think. Right. Even if it is a director you admire and trust. Well sure. I mean it doesn't yeah. mean you're not taking direction. You are, but you have to bring something ah. to the table. And you right. have to have some gauge as to whether or not you're being effective. Your job uh-huh. is to tell the story. Yeah, yeah. Your job is to show up with some idea how to do that and then be malleable uh-huh. and available to tell it more effectively according to somebody who's looking from the outside. Uh-huh. But your job is also to connect 
with the person in front of you. And if yes. you're preoccupied with somebody else judging you or judging yourself, mm. then you're not really connected to the person in front of you. And then to me, that's not huh. acting. That's not very interesting to do, right. certainly. It's really boring. And are you worried that that's going to happen to you, that you're going to lose? I'm not worried. I just, you know, I like the rhythm of the theater. I like what mm. it asks me to do. I, I like yeah. the challenge of being asked to repeat something mm -hmm. and make it feel spontaneous and also deepen it. Mm -hmm. And I like the lubrication of living through a story to its climax Ooh. and then coming down from it. I think that keeps my Ooh, wow. keeps yeah. my muscles ready so yeah. that when I do pop back into TV, mm. I haven't um, stepped away from that machinery for yeah. very long. And I, and I have access to it because you can wow. get rusty, I think. I mean, it also seems like you haven't stepped away in a while. You've been working very hard. I have. I start <laughs> rehearsal tomorrow on, on a new play. On, wh on where? I'm uh, I'm doing tomorrow. Amy. Yeah, I start I start tomorrow. Oh Amy Herzog's new play, Mary oh. Jane, which premiered up at Yale Rep with okay, some great cool. actors up there, and um, this is the New York premiere, and it's a play that I did a reading of very early when Amy first wrote it, uh -huh. and it just so happened that this time they've come back to me and I'm available to do it because it's you know a couple of months really. Yeah. Well, three months, and I was oh. reading a lot of TV scripts. I've read a lot of film scripts. Mm -hmm. I've been offered some some television, a mostly five- to eight-year contracts, and I just wasn't ready oh, wow. to, to commit to something like yeah. that. And I'm always looking for the best writing, and, you know, yeah. sometimes it's a play. Yeah, and you got to get back in touch with that mm -hmm. that stage yeah. presence. Yeah. And the rhythm of that life is actually very appealing to me. You know, in TV and film, you work 17-hour days. Yeah, you don't know what your imagine. schedule is going to be yeah. until the night before. You often sit around and wait. Yeah, There's yeah. no sitting around and waiting in the theater. Yeah. When you're there from 12 to 6, you're working for six hours, mm -hmm. and then you go home. And when and it's so interesting because then the strange thing about the theater life is that your whole life flips once you start performance. So then right. you're off during then the day, during the and day. you're working at night. Yeah. It's a very unusual way to live, but I like it. Yeah. I like that life. I yeah. like having days free all of a sudden. Yeah. And um, You've kind of earned it after that. I the, think so, like yeah. The, especially like the preview process. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's rigorous. Yeah. Six days a week, sure. you know. You miss all the weddings and all the funerals. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, I can't. I'm in a show. Mm -hmm. um, but you, how did you, congratulations on an Emmy Award Thank nomination. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and your TCA Award, which was just the other day. Yes, it was. It was great. It was you such won. a lovely event. Yeah. You won for the first time for two performances. The critics have been so Ugh. generous about The right. Leftovers in particular yeah. and Fargo, but really the love letters for The Leftovers this season blew us away. Yeah. Completely. It means a lot to mm -hmm. a lot of people. And it, it really a does. A lot of those people are, are, are journalists who really dedicated, it seems like this season, a lot of mm -hmm. time to covering it. And really personal, so. personal pieces yeah. about it. People wrote Ooh. very personally about their connection, and I'm so yes. moved by that. I definitely want to get into that. Yeah. But um, how did you come to be on these two different shows, and how did you pull it off, for one thing? <laughs> well, they didn't shoot at the same time, yeah. but I'll go back to the beginning. <laughs> I was um, doing Virginia Woolf, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, on Broadway. Yes, indeed. We had closed in March. We'd closed early. We were playing to half houses most of our run. You closed in March? And yes. When you, oh, when you started? And the oh, Tonys okay. were in, what, Ju in, yeah, July? June or, whatever, yeah. June or July? July, maybe. June. And you closed so we had closed that, that early, so we didn't think we weren't sure if we'd still be remembered by the time <laughs> <laughs> Tony season rolled yeah. around. So then, of course, the show was nominated for Best Revival, Best Actor, Best Actress, mm -hmm. Best Featured Actress, Best Direction. The undersung Remarkable. Madison Dirks was left out of that, which we all still um, smart right. about. But anyhow, right, right, right. so the Tonys happened in June. So I stayed in New York those couple of months oh, okay. to take general meetings, and I had transitioned to a larger agency. I'd been with a great agency in Chicago for years, Stuart mm -hmm. Talent. They'd picked me up right out of grad school, and they were wonderful. But I just needed more access to opportunity, mm -hmm. so I moved to Gersh at that time. So they were sending me on generals, and I'd had a general with Ellen Lewis, who's a great yes. casting director. She's from Chicago. She's a great theater person. She sees everything, so she knows who's out there. Yeah. And so a couple weeks later... I think it was in July, probably by then. She called me in to audition for The Leftovers. I had read the book. I was a big Tom Parada fan, so I knew the book. Oh, cool. And Tracy had actually auditioned for the role that Justin Thoreau ended up right. playing. Because in the book, he's actually this. an older oh. mayor. He's a different type uh -huh. entirely. And, of course, for TV, it's much more glamorous. <laughs> Justin Thoreau. And it makes sense, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I went in. I did a couple of scenes on camera. And they taped it, and then they showed it to Damon. And then I, I think it was about, I don't know, Ten days later, they uh -huh. said, we'd like you to come in and sit down with Damon. I wow. said, lovely. And Damon and I had a really great, very personal yeah. talk about life. Amy Brenneman said the same thing. Yes, he's very, he kind of gets right down to totally. it. Yeah. 
which I love. I don't. I sort of don't believe in small talk anymore. Um, yeah. I kind of get right to the heart of yeah. things. I have people telling me their life stories in 20 minutes. But um, yeah, yeah. Let's and and then we figured after that that meeting, my agents were like, okay, now we have to wait for network approval. You'll probably have to test all the. the this is how uh-huh. this is going to go. Yeah. But because Damon was given such creative control of the show, gotcha. I just got an offer a yeah. couple weeks later. Amazing. Which was, yeah, it was lovely. So I've never of, actually of tested like, for a pilot or any of it. I've oh, never done yeah, yeah, that yeah. stuff. That was your big, that was your small screen debut. That's right. Amazing. And then that was, um, so that was July. And it, a couple weeks later, I did a tape for Gone Girl in my living room. Amazing. So that same month, I booked Gone Girl off a tape. I went to L.A. for the first time and auditioned for David Fincher and drove around L.A. with the GPS going on all these generals. I booked a TV spot out there on CBS, I think. So I stayed out. Gotcha. I ended up staying in L.A. for a couple of weeks. And while I was shooting that guest star spot, I got the call that I had booked Gone Girl for sure. And then that started almost Feature immediately. Film debut. Yeah. So I went and I shot the pilot of Leftovers in New York. Uh-huh. At the end of July or the beginning of August, and then I went immediately to Missouri to do um, six uh-huh. weeks in Missouri with for Gone Girl. Brad and David, yeah, and everyone else who was involved in that. Yep, it was great. Your very first feature film, you were acting opposite Ben Affleck under David Fincher. Yeah, that's crazy. It was terrifying. Was it like out of body? Like, where am I? What am I doing here? The nice thing about being from the Midwest and not yeah. knowing anything is that you don't know enough to be as scared as you should be. Right. And I was so naive. I had never set out to be, you know, a Hollywood actor or whatever you want to call mm. it. And so I didn't really understand the scope of some of these things that were happening to me while they were happening. It wasn't until That's I was able to have time though. in retrospect. It was such a blessing. Yeah. And so I was just sort of an open, I was ready to learn. And at first it was kind of scary because David, um, there's so much vocabulary I didn't know. Yeah. And David would, I remember the first day I had a scene, he he said, I need more screen direction and I need more screen direction. I need you to look up. And he was, he was very technical. He was trying to get me to look up from a magazine at a particular angle. And I didn't know what he was saying. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Right. And, and he, he said, you can't do it. And he got frustrated with me. And, of course, I was absolutely devastated. And Ben was really sweet. Ben was like, don't worry. It's fine, you know. Uh And I thought I was going to get fired because you do get fired off of David Fincher projects. But then the next day I said to him, I said, David, you've hired somebody who's new. You knew that (laughs) going in. I need a little help. When I understand what you need, I can do it. Wow. And and then from that day, he used to pull me aside and say, see the monitor? See how tight this is? I need you to glide out on your right foot because it's this tight. Do you see that? I'm like, yep. Okay. So he started to teach me glide things. Glide out on your right foot? Yeah, you have to sort of like you know, very wow. carefully slide out of frame. And he he was so lovely to me and he was so helpful. And so I got huh. to go to David Fincher school and then yeah. go make season one of The Leftovers. I see. And mm-hmm. it's so interesting. That yeah, you got I learned the a crash lot. course from him before working with... Totally. But after booking the job. And so I think when I look at Gone Girl, it's so interesting because they came mm. out in reverse order. Leftovers yeah. aired first and then Gone Girl came out in theaters right. later that year. And I think I improved between Gone Girl and Leftovers. Yeah. So I was like, oh, everyone's going to think I've, I'm backsliding when they see <laughs> these projects true. back to back. You were really back. funny in Gone Girl. You really kind of stole the show. <laughs> um, and then Leftovers was just... The curious thing about that show is that, as you said, as we covered, like, critics really loved it. Mm-hmm. But it, the ratings were never no. quite there, nope. apparently. No, we had 700,000 people watching on a good day. Which is so strange because it's one of the greatest shows, one of the greatest dramas on TV. Thank and you. very, very personal. Mm-hmm. But how, I mean, I have trouble explaining to people why they should watch right. it. Right. Well, they have to get through season one, I think, because it's mm-hmm. it's really humorless, which feels inauthentic. Yes. Because mm. human beings use humor to deal with death and everything. Yes, right. And so when, you, when something doesn't have a sense of humor, it doesn't feel real. Yeah. yeah. And I think if you can get through that part... Because there's some really smart, wonderful stuff in yes. that first season, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's still an abs- kind of an absurdity, mm-hmm. but it's mostly the darkness, and I think the the show kind of develops a sense of humor about Most itself. Most we almost. recover it early in season two, and we, yeah. and then it gets weirder and funnier it as it weird. goes on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is hard to convince people. But see, I've always thought it. I guess I'm. I, I've always been skewed a little darker and so Mm. i've always found the show to be about resilience i've always found it to be hopeful and i never we were so surprised to hear that people thought it was so hopeless because to me it felt like Mm. look how in the face of this tragedy people continue yeah look how human beings find tiny threads of hope and purpose when there shouldn't be anything yeah and i always found that to be kind of amazing and it's because the show's focus is not on 
what happened? Mm-hmm. What's the supernatural element of it? Like, what is the explanation? It's more about what happens mm-hmm. in the aftermath. What yes, and how do human beings make meaning and why are we compelled to do it? Yeah. We're, we're all doing it. Yeah. And we want our entertainment for some reason to be so neat and clean yeah. and resolved when our lives are like that <laughs> not at all. Yeah. And that's so why I, The Leftovers is delightful but also challenging. Yes, yeah. I want to make art that's challenging. Yeah. And it's hard to make TV that's challenging and not disposable. I agree. And it's hard to make TV that's personal. Like you said, like people are writing these like reviews of it or mm-hmm. these articles about it that are mostly about themselves and their own experience. That was yeah. certainly my experience watching of like, I'm learning about how I process uh-huh. grief and Oh, loss. that's so lovely to hear. I mean, what was your relationship with grief and loss before this project? Well, I haven't experienced a whole lot of it, frankly. Uh-huh. Um, I have three grandparents in their 90s. My parents are uh-huh. married and alive and well. But you um, now, but then you were asked to play a character who lost their whole family. I was, and my secret, and I've spoken of this before, it's a book called Wave by Sonali Dernigala, mm-hmm. who lost her family in the tsunami, and that was the nearest real life equivalent I could find, yeah. because she, her husband, her two children, and her parents were swept away in an instant, Just dis- disappeared, like disappeared the before her eyes, and it's such an unfathomable right. circumstance, and so there's no one who could relate to her. Pain. Right. Oh. And she writes so honestly about the process of grief and how insane she was mm. and how it took her four years to even set foot in her home in London. Mm. And there are these details in the book that are so heart wrenching. Yeah. She's an economist and she writes in this very spare, unstinting way. Oh, she's not a writer, per se, but she's really, really honest about all of it. And that became a that Bible. It was a Bible for me. I carried yeah. it around on set for three years because if there was a day where I had to go into that place of loss, mm-hmm. you know, those scenes where she sees her family at the table or she sees Holy Wayne or mm. I had to Ugh. have some way in just in case because you, it's after lunch. You're tired. Right. You're hungry. And you, you don't get you don't get a second chance. Yeah. That's the day you're shooting that scene. You don't get to go back tomorrow and do it again. Right. So you have to show up on the day. And um Hmm. Her book was indispensable to me, and I, I hope it never feels exploitative to hear me say that it was a resource, but it, mm. it was I, – I, I have such respect for it yeah. as, a, as an examination of what it is to be a human being in that grief, and I think it's, I think it's a book that everyone should read. That's so interesting that you say that no one can relate to that kind of grief because that is – your role as an actor, your job as an actor, right? Right, right exactly. Especially in this particular role. Yes, course, I always but. say that to be an actor is to accept that you are capable of anything, mm. good or bad. You have to acknowledge that possibility in yourself. Yeah. And oof. therefore, you know, you have to accept the possibility of any circumstance that could happen to you. And take responsibility for the fact that you can do that. Yes. Which is easier said than done. I think so, yeah. probably. Most of us don't really want to look that hard. At <laughs> no, and go that and plumb those depths. Mm-hmm. You and to... also come up against your limitations. That's what really happens is you get exposed mm. to the things that you're not good at or that you don't have access to. Wow. And you have to figure out how do you, will you be able to drill down into that thing or is it just something you're not going to get asked to do? It's a really, it's it's very, um, it does, <laughs> it's, it's a very honest examination that happens because you just come up against that stuff all the time. Can I ask you mm-hmm. what kinds of, specific things you've come against in that way because I don't think of you as someone who has limitations. <laughs> well, now let me also, yeah, the flip side of that is that actors never want to be typecast and we never want yeah. to believe we have limitations mm. and we want to think we can play anything, including, you know, 22 when we're 40. So, sure, sure. But honestly, I, I think one of the hardest things to do, frankly, is play scared. It's oh. a lot of big eyes and breathing. Yeah. And you just feel like <laughs> such a ham. It's just the worst. Right. So I think oh, scared acting is really hard. I think it's much harder huh. than crying. Right up there is is angry because it's really easy for angry to get super general. Yeah, or one anger is almost or... always general. Yeah, yeah, it's really boring to play. Yeah. It's not as interesting. Um, hmm. Playing against anger is usually better a better choice uh, <laughs> than playing yeah, yeah, anger. Yeah. I feel like um, Nora but I think Durst scared acting is the worst. Nora, Nora fights against. Yeah, she does. Also. Yeah, she does. And then every now and then she gets to go <laughs> go right into them. But yeah. the other thing that I think is really hard is when you have to do a scene where you have to laugh and you have to repeat it. Yeah. And it starts to I'm get sure. into that weird fake laugh moment where yeah. you're like, ah, you're making this horrible <laughs> face. And yeah. That's that's never. And your good. director has to be like, okay, well, like, that's, that's not. Can you not think really. of something? Think of something funny. Think of something funny on the fiftieth. <laughs> take. Right. Like, yeah, you tough. have to sort of refresh it every time. It's horrible. That's interesting. Scared acting that that's, that's oh. something that you've struggled oh, with. Oh, I've done some horrible scared acting <laughs> in, in my day. Oh, yeah. Wide eyes. Worst. Sweat. 
breathe. <laughs> there it is, the breath again, though. Yeah, you gotta it's be in touch with the, the only way in. If you yeah. have to fake it, I'm, I promise you that you're going to find it by changing the way you're breathing. Yeah, whatever that interesting. Means. Yeah, and changing the way you're breathing in every take is that a good maybe. trick? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Or you find the thing that works huh. and you keep doing it. I find, for example, on stage when you're doing a play for weeks or years, <laughs> that's what, how we did Virginia Woolf, it was yeah. actually years, what happens is that your body actually starts to take care of you. Your body starts to remember the guideposts in the play, mm-hmm. and when it knows the crying scene is coming, it, it your body Anticipates. does it. Now, there are also days where your body's like, oh, hungry. Uh-huh. And it's like, we don't have the resources yeah. to cry today. Yeah, and you got to play generally, some other trick. Yeah, exactly. Right. You have to just sort of, you know, fake it and let the audience not know the difference. Yeah. Because it doesn't matter if I cry, it matters if you cry. Yes. And I've, I've often found that when an actor is resisting crying is when I'm more likely to mm-hmm. yeah, that makes sense. experience that That emotion. makes sense. You know that feeling of yeah. trying not to. <laughs> but isn't that the eight shows a day thing, isn't that dangerous to, um, to have your body anticipate certain things and... You fall into the danger of becoming predictable, or I guess um I guess I don't think of it as anticipation. Mm. I feel like I, certainly certainly anticipation is always a pitfall when you're repeating a performance. Absolutely, yeah. and if you're not listening, then you're probably anticipating. That's all right? about listening. Yeah. And if you're not breathing, you're mm-hmm. not listening. Mm. So for me, okay, if I catch myself thinking about my grocery list in the middle of a scene, sure, which happens totally, yeah, then I go, oh, yeah, you're not. I'm not breathing. Every breathe. single time, yeah. I'm not breathing. So hmm. that's interesting. To to breathe is to be present, and to be present is to listen. And breathing that's and the work of being on stage, I think, is to try to be... You know, you're, it's yeah. a percentage game. You're trying to be present for yeah. as, as high a percentage of time as you can. That's the game. Yeah. And you'll never reach 100. Never. Oh, interesting. But it's so thrilling <laughs> when you get close, because then right. it, you feel, you're so in the moment, you don't feel... You know, you feel a little unmoored. It's yeah. great. It's a great feeling. It's exhilarating. And I love that, too, you can get really close to 100 when only in rehearsal or, like, after right. the sh- after <laughs> yeah. the show's over. Yeah, yeah, you really feel like you're getting there, and yeah. then it's close. Like, I had a friend who said that she na- she finally nailed, um, she was the main character in Miracle Worker, mm-hmm. not Helen, but mm-hmm. the, um, that yeah. she was on her computer late at night one night, and she just started saying the monologue, and she just knew that she, like, Nailed it. Cracked it. And it was like weeks after the show was over. Yep. And that happens. Oh, happens all the time. And you just have to accept that you're not going to reach 100, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I, I mean, it's it, what's lovely is that there's always a goal that mm. you're working toward, and you can always get better at it. So it's mm. never, yeah. you never plateau, really, because you'll never attain it. Yeah. And so in that way, it's the, the carrot is always in front of you, which is what makes it so huh. exciting. It's why people get addicted and keep doing it. Interesting. Is that why? <laughs> I think so. I th- yeah, yeah, I yeah. think so. That's so cool. It's it's wonderful to be in a job that invites you to be present. Most jobs don't. Right. And so right. when you get a taste of what it is to live your life in that way, it's hard to go back. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And I, I don't think actors necessarily automatically then translate that into their regular lives, but I think we've got a better chance of doing it because yeah, we actually have okay. a job that asks it of us. Right. And that... the. Plumbing the depths and uh, even the research and grief and getting into that deep, deep place. I mean, is mm-hmm. that therapeutic? That's my favorite part. It more just feels like I loved school. I was such a nerd. <laughs> and I loved being in college. And I loved. I never missed classes because I loved being in class. Yeah. And I love reading. And so for me, it's just such a wonderful invitation to continue in education mm, in, in cool. things I wouldn't normally have an, an interest or opportunity to explore. And so... Yeah. For me, that's what's exciting about being an actor. I've, I've technically, I've, I've often been very research heavy. I do a lot of reading. Sure. And I've found that more recently, my process is getting a little more physical, which has been interesting and fun. Oh, cool. But I still, I still like to supplement with uh-huh. reading toward the subject, even if it's oblique. Reading around, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And when you say getting more physical, what does that? Mean? Well, I, I have to say, Fargo was one of the more mm. obvious examples of that because. First of all, the writing is very specific. So everything you need is on the page. You don't mm-hmm. need anything else. It's it's all there for you. Yeah. And then you have an accent. You put on a heavy pair of boots. You put on a scratchy police uniform. You put on a 15-pound belt. You cut your and hair. Cold out, gloves. Or? Yep, cold yeah. out, flappy hat. Yeah. And you're already walking and speaking differently. It's and an then and then there's the, you know, specificity there right for you. So right. it's it's I don't want to say easy, but it's no. certainly but it's outside a, in. Um, Noel, Noel Holly kind of presents you with a, a rule book or a guide mm-hmm. guidebook yeah. 
Definitely. Yeah. There's like a style guide. It's the MLA yeah. handbook for MLA, yeah. Actors. Because that's what the Fargo universe is. It's a it's a universe. Mm-hmm. And it has its own weird rules. Yes. For how people talk and how scenes begin and end. Yep. And yes. how violence <laughs> enters Unfolds. into our lives. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it, like a rule book that he's a template for mm. playing inside of. It's it's good. We thrive having restrictions. You know, you have restrictions and you have to figure out how to be inside of them. And I think that's actually really fruitful. Yeah. And I love the outside in thing. I love that the hat mm-hmm. helps you make Gloria Yeah, you I mean happen. your boot my boots were so heavy. I immediately mm. was walking mm. in a different way. Or you have to, you know, wield a rifle. And suddenly yeah, which your body just you do research on that too. <laughs> you have you have a you know, we had an armor um, Greg, who was giving us the oh, quick okay. and dirty version yeah. of how to do that stuff in a way that didn't, yeah. you know, she didn't look like an idiot. Uh-huh. I'm sure I did. <laughs> no. Luckily, they were shot well. in such a way that made me look like I knew what I was doing, but I certainly did. Well, and it's also the thing where if a character in that universe looks like an idiot, it's on purpose. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One can hope. Um, you have said that Frances McDormand is one of your mm. like influences or one of your favorite just oh. character actors. Yeah. Like how let's talk about her performance in Fargo. Like first of all, did it influence this? I'm sure it must have in some way. Well, only insofar as that you have to avoid it. You have to avoid it. I think so because mm-hmm. otherwise Yeah. it's an impossible rubric and you're mm-hmm. never going to be that. You have to be your own version of it. Yeah. And so I think if you I don't like to have too much of that in me or else I'll be tempted. Yeah, you're not going to watch the movie Fargo right before you walk on. No, yeah. and and same with Virginia Woolf. When we were doing Virginia Woolf at Steppenwolf, yeah, the the thing they kept saying over and over in rehearsal was we're approaching it like it's a new play that's never been done before. Cool. Okay. Because Ooh, you can't yeah. try to repeat something that's not you. Even though, even if it's been done a million times. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. And I think that's why our production was well received because I think we rebalanced the play God. in favor of George. It's. It's George's play. Mm. But anyway, yeah, that was the benefit of that process. But um, Well, and you sort of reinvented Honey, I think. I mean, I hope it's, I hope she's, you know, distinctive. Everybody wants to be Sandy Dennis, but we just, you know, I'll never be Sandy Dennis. I'm only <laughs> no. going to be Carrie Coon. No, in terms of type, no. It's very she's, different. I, I did think of my teeth a lot, though. Oh. Because she, she just, her whole performance feels like it comes through her For teeth. Her front teeth. Yeah, 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 and I, so I would think of my teeth sometimes. I couldn't help it. Interesting. But with Frances, I just, mm. I just think she's... She's a consummate artist. She's not mm-hmm. caught up in any of the other business. She she right. just makes yeah. things, and she yeah. doesn't come to red carpets. And if she does, yeah. she's in her jean jacket. Yeah. And if <laughs> we all did Tony that together, jacket. we could stop this nonsense. <laughs> but so we true. won't. That's so true. But I love that she's leading the charge. I, I did you see yeah. her performance in Olive Kittredge? Yes. I just thought that was sublime. Yeah. I just think she's sublime. Incredible. And she has been since she was a young, young person. Mm. That breakout role in a Coen Brothers movie, that, who's the name that eludes me right now, of course, but yeah. I can't think of it. But she was so young when she got that part. Mm-hmm. And she's um, she's an unconventional beauty. She's not yeah. um, she's not typical. No. And same with Meryl Streep. I mean, Meryl Streep's not a typical beauty. Sure. She was a stunning young woman, but she's an interesting looking person, yes. first and foremost, she's who transforms. Kind of movie star. Yeah, 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 not traditional. Um, I should ask you about the papers. <gasps> yeah. Later. But um, F- Frances, the thing about her performance in, in Fargo is it's very hard to explain why it's like maybe one of the greatest screen performances ever. Mm-hmm. Because she's the only normal per- Well, she's the stable one. Right. And the the world around her is devolving and it's chaos and it's crazy. Mm-hmm. And it's like hard to, I've like tried to explain to people like why I consider that to be one of the best. First of all, it's the best monologue in film yeah. at the end. Oh, yeah. She's so great. And she's talking about it's a beautiful day. Yeah. And it's, I mean, what is the deal with, with underplaying? What is the deal with mm-hmm. like, I love this idea of fighting against the emotion mm-hmm. and of maybe making the smaller choice or making the non-choice rather than the big choice. Well, I, I, I feel like there's certainly space for that in TV and film. But mm-hmm. I also think one of the things that was special about that movie and her performance mm-hmm. is that she does capture an essential character of the Midwest. Mm-hmm. And so often those people do not see themselves represented in film. Mm. The other thing yeah. is she, she as a woman, as you say, the stable person at the center of the chaos. And the fact that she's a woman, yes. And that's what women do. Right. But they're never represented in film that way. Right. And the right. the women I know were always holding down 
the fort, yes. always. Okay. The women in my life have always been that way. Yeah. And, and we so rarely saw it that I think sometimes we don't even realize mm. we're responding to those performances because... There's, we just never They're get so to see true. them, but they yeah, feel yeah. so true to us totally. and our experience. And Fargo is a sneaky example of that happening, mm. I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Gloria, so on paper, she's similar to Francis' character mm -hmm. in the movie. But, I mean, and I read somewhere, I think it was Noah, who said that it's different in that Francis in the movie starts in a place of everything stable and then it's thrown into this chaos. Mm -hmm. But Gloria starts yeah. and her she her world just makes no sense. Yeah. Like, she's totally overwhelmed. Yeah. She's lost her job and her and her marriage mm -hmm. kinda all at once. Yep. And she's dazed, I think. Yeah. She's and then she loses struck. her father in law. Yeah. Who was a very complicated man. Right. And she sees her community devolving around her horrific him. murder. Yeah. And yeah, she's she's at such a low point. And so mm. for her to muster the energy to mm. even be Minnesota nice is so hard. Yeah. And she's kind of over it. <laughs> to the mansplainers around her. Yes, and she's yeah, she's so over the mansplaining. I yeah. think Shea Wiggum is so great in that part. Um Yeah. <laughs> I was so mad at him. I know, and he, he was so desperate to humanize it because Shay is so not that man. Uh -huh, uh -huh. He's a very sensitive guy. Yeah. And he he so wanted his character, Mo Damick, to be a a human being, and I, I was just like, you're like, yeah. I'm like Shay. He's he's an asshole. He's like, yeah. I know, but I I don't want him to be just an asshole. I'm like, I get it, but he is. Anyway, it was just so funny to watch uh, him, watch him, you know, it's so reason with that guy. Audience, yeah. yeah, but but unfortunately, again, so many women can relate to of that. Of course. And and I wish it I wish it didn't feel right so commonplace, but yeah, it does. Yeah. It's very frustrating. Yeah, and that's not like the point of Fargo. But it's one of several points that this season made, I think. Mm -hmm. And I'm really fascinated by the idea of, like, not to get too political, but, yeah. like, this idea of fake news. Yes. And of narrative overriding reality. Mm -hmm. And I like that the third season of this show kind of posited that as a series of coincidences that are so bizarre, mm. they can't be real. Uh -huh. And Gloria's the only one saying, no, 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 they're, that's reality. Yeah, I call bullshit on your story. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's um that's why artists are important and necessary because yeah. they they take the times that we're living in and they filter them mm -hmm. and they boil down sort of the essential character of the time and maybe even present the possibility for how we survive it and mm -hmm. that's what they put into their work and then and then we get to absorb it in a way that's less direct than watching the news. And maybe inside of that being mm. n not entirely our reality and being quote unquote entertainment, there may be a little space for hope and possibility. Yeah. And I think looking back on this time in our country, yeah. I think works like Noah's will stand out as having mm. been, um, you know, a very a very savvy and nuanced way of filtering what yeah. we, what Noah is experiencing in the world. Mm. Artists have been doing that forever. That's their job. Yeah, but like you said, absorb. I love that. Mm. You absorb story, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Through yeah. like empathy. Yes, hopefully. Geez, like you know, that's why characters. we need the humanities more than ever mm -hmm. at a time when they're being cut. Yeah, squashed. <laughs> My program that I went through at Wisconsin is gone. What happened? Scott Walker cut all the funding to the university. Oh my God. Yeah. So, Wisconsin, the university, which was a pioneer in education oh and union, you know, unions, um, is now decimated. Decimated. That's horrible. Yeah. No, it's a we, there's an assault on. Yeah. But what's interesting about, you know, artists always thrive in in times when they're most mm. um, harassed and yeah. um and suppressed. And I think we're seeing some really fascinating mm. art come out of this time. Yeah. It's a tumultuous time to be an artist. It's great. Yeah. And and subversive. Anything with a woman in it feels subversive totally. right now. Handmaid's Tale is Which totally is subversive. Yeah. Yeah. And it's important and necessary. There, there is an assault on mm -hmm. our basic rights, yeah. and um, and it has been going on for a very long time. And it's yeah. only now that TV is starting to to exactly. really eclipse film in its possibilities and um, yep. start showing us women that we actually recognize. 
that's certainly on the in terms of women, it's certainly true for TV. Mm-hmm. I'm just looking at the Emmys. I mean, looking at your oh. your fellow nominees in your Emmy category, it's ridiculous, nuts. Yeah, it's nuts. All these <laughs> <laughs> Academy Award, you know, <laughs> nominees are coming in to do TV. They're doing it for a reason. You know, this is yeah. where that's where the interesting work for women is happening. Mm-hmm. And and all these years, you know, TV actors have always <laughs> been striving to get into film. Because that meant you were mm. you'd arrived right, and that you made that transition was, and it was hard to make that transition for twenty women years or ago for, all actors. for actors. Yeah. You know, you were a TV actor or you were a film Jump actor, film. and now we live in such a fluid time totally. where people are doing both, and they're not getting pigeonholed in the same mm-hmm. way. And there's way much there's or as you know, TV. TV actors would probably say that the movie stars are coming to take all their jobs, <laughs> just like just like the stars came into voiceovers and took all the commercial voiceovers uh, away from the voiceover actors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's real. The struggle is real. <laughs> yeah. But I think that TV is not the forefront of, like like you said, like the subversive mm-hmm. nature of art. Yeah, they're, they can take more risks because it's yeah. like these tiny packages and they, they just throw money at something and if it fails, it goes away. It's right. not a big deal. Right. And it's really just to, you know, drive traffic to Amazon. You know, the, the story itself is kind of, <laughs> story be damned, who cares? Yeah, wow. Just get us to that website. So they'll put anything <laughs> on the air, which is amazing. Oh wow. Well, and speaking of like subversive and of the times, tell me about the papers because I know it's not super relevant to the purposes of this podcast. But <laughs> I was just talking to Bob Odenkirk as well. Oh, you about were. The movie. Oh, I love I love Bob. Yeah. Um, it's the most incredible cast. It's pretty wild. Ever it's a seen. time capsule. It's a time capsule mm. of who's working in TV and film in 2017. Yeah, right now, yeah, yeah. everybody's in it. Um, yes, I think it's an interesting. Of course, it's it's it surrounds the Pentagon Papers, mm-hmm. Watergate. Um, an attempt to suppress freedom of speech. Mm. What is the purpose of the media? You know, what purpose does the Fifth Estate serve um, mm. at a time when journalism is under assault as a yeah. as a critical piece of our democracy? Yeah, as a basic yeah. Yeah, and thing. the truth. You know, the the importance of the truth. Yeah. Also, what's interesting about the story of the Pentagon Papers is that at the time the Pentagon Papers came out. Most people in the country didn't know anything about them. Mm-hmm. It was happening on the coasts. Mm-hmm. It's very similar to what's happening now. Mm. The, the coastal elites, right. <laughs> I'll call them, are very preoccupied with criticizing what's happening in D.C. But in middle America, uh-huh. there's an opioid crisis. There are no jobs. I mean, yeah. it's just a very different time. And so you'll see, much like Nixon, mm. Nixon's support was entirely stable even after he was even after he resigned. And it's the same thing. Trump's base isn't going anywhere. Mm-mm. They're always going to believe what they believe, um, but it's Even up to the rest of us to sort of yeah. embrace the reality of yeah, to the impact. on it. Mm-hmm, yeah. yeah, and that's what the papers is about. It's about these journalists being brave, stepping up, um, taking responsibility for, for sharing the truth with right. the American people and standing up to an administration, and that's why it's important. Yeah, and it's something that shouldn't require bravery. It shouldn't require that kind of action. No, it's just but... the code of ethics for a profession, right. and, and <laughs> <But>. yet— <laughs> And here we are. And yet we're deeply mistrustful of that. Yeah. I now. think that's why so many Americans are reeling because truth and fact don't seem to be impeachable things. But no, and when there are no facts, then you can't you, argue no, a, a rational position. It's like quick There's sand. no argument. Yeah. And it's really terrifying. And yeah. the proliferation of of this misinformation and how accessible yeah. it is. You know, Fox News is a propaganda machine. Fully. And the people who watch that are not getting the full story. Mm-hmm. And I find that my friends who are, I have family members who are much more conservative. Mm-hmm. And so I feel that I, I'm not somebody who's just living, you know, inside of New York or Chicago with surrounded by my friends who mm-hmm. are all, <laughs> you know, liberals. I mm-hmm. have a lot of people in my life who are not. And I have to say what I find disturbing about that is that they don't tend to read as widely as my liberal friends. So my liberal friends yeah. are much will- much more willing to investigate a source beyond what they read yeah. and support it. And my conservatives' friends and family sort of accept what's given them. Mm-hmm. There's a lack of, a, of curiosity and a lack of investigation. Yes. Yeah. And that's what I think is the difference. Yeah. That's why, you know, there's this, there's this complaint about bias in universities, having a liberal bias. But fundamentally, the humanities require a certain degree of intellectual Open-minded. curiosity, totally. which I feel is lacking on the side yeah. of the divide. Um, yeah. I hate to say. Well, and it's interesting you mentioned that uh, Frances McDormand's character in Fargo is represented, it's a representation of middle America mm-hmm. that yeah. we just don't often see. That's often maybe caricature or... Sure. But smart. She's still smart. Yeah. You know, it's not a it's not a condescending portrait. No. There are some really smart and people there. And those are rare. There. Yeah. yeah. Oftentimes it's just, yeah, you're, you're talked down to or... Right. 
And that, again, goes back to the just power of art. Like, if anything can get us to relate and to open our minds mm-hmm. and to see, you know, perspectives that aren't ours. Yeah, I mean, look at gay marriage. The the, the acceleration mm-hmm. of that movement would never have yeah, happened huge. without Will and Grace. I agree, yeah. You know, if you, don't, if you don't Joe live Biden next door. you watched Will and Grace. Yeah. The momentum. yeah. I mean, that, then then these people are demystified for you if mm-hmm. you don't know them. And that's yeah. what's happening right now with, you know, with Islam. Most of the communities mm-hmm. who are protesting against Sharia law have never met a Muslim. Yeah. And and without exposure. how could they? Exposure, like, they? Yeah. Right. You're not getting, you're not being able to make that distinction right. and say, oh, actually, this person values the exact same things yeah. I value. Yeah. They pay taxes, too. Mm-hmm. Like, that kind of thing. Yeah. They yeah. love their children. <laughs> they want their kids right. to get an education. Yeah. They want their kids to live a better life than I lived. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the same. And that's why media representation is so critical. All that it comes down to. Yep. Because well, when if all you know is on your TV screen, <laughs> you got to fill it with. Well, yeah, you do. That's it's a way to reach the masses. You yeah. know, they're not reading the newspaper. Yeah. How central is that to your identity as an actor? Like, is that you're not going out accepting jobs, and every time you're reading a script and every time you're doing your research, you're not. That's not at the forefront. I, I assume that's not priority number one. Hmm. You want to do the work, right? And you want to play. Yeah, I want something that's challenging to me. Mm-hmm. First and foremost, if it's not on the page, it's not there. Mm-hmm. So it's it's always writing. Mm-hmm. The second thing is, what does it ask of me that's different from what's been asked of me before? Very cool, yeah. And then, of course, the third consideration is has to do with the career advancement. Does this uh-huh. open possibility, you know, opportunities for me yeah. in the future? Does this give me um, a payday so that I can go do the independent film gotcha. that I want to do mm. and still survive as an artist? That's very practical. And so the first two are much more heavily weighted than the third, but I can't yeah. ignore the third component, yeah. certainly. And I don't think working actors at the beginning of their careers should either. No, they should say, and they should say yes to everything at the beginning. I said okay. yes to everything for okay. years, no cool. matter what, because there's always something to be learned, even from a terrible experience. Yeah. You just say yes. And I've then you get to that. say no. That's the privilege. Right. You work to the success. point where you can yep. say no. Where you turn down everybody. <laughs> right. It's the only power there. you get. You have very little control over anything else. Right. Hence motion capture work. Yeah. Hence. Voiceovers. I did. Mm-hmm. Um, I was editing dissertations for English oh. as second language students when I was oh, at the cool. university because I was an English major and uh-huh. a lit major in college. So. And I, I wrote a couple voiceover scripts. I was always in language in a way okay. that I felt I wasn't far from my profession. I never right. waited tables. I was terrible at it. Uh-huh. Couldn't have done it. <laughs> um, but I was always working in my in my field. Uh-huh. And I was able in the Midwest, in Chicago, to make my living that way. Right. And occasionally go on unemployment, but generally make my living in the theater. Amazing. Yes. I don't know if it's possible now. I haven't lived in Chicago mm enough <laughs> now to know if that's changed a lot yeah but i'm sure it's still i'm sure still it's, it's a struggle because i know real estate prices know have gone up in and new food york and, oh my gosh i don't know how anybody does it exactly. in new york you're all living six to a house into your 40s i couldn't do it right i just want to live Especially by myself in the theater oh it's impossible it pay the bills no it pays the same amount of money in chicago but it's yeah the cost of living is five mm. times what it is there yeah it's impossible i don't know how anybody does it i think it's very no, brave totally um but i wouldn't have done it I wouldn't have moved here out of undergrad. I would and be too scared. That's so interesting. I mean, but you never considered doing anything else, right? I mean, uh, I was an English and Spanish major. I was going to be a linguist. Mm. And I had an audition, and I got into grad school, and my parents mm-hmm. said, what the hell, go to go to acting school. So <laughs> I did. what the hell, okay. Yeah. yeah. And I had the great good fortune of getting an apprenticeship at the American Players Theater in Spring Green, which is a m- magical sh- outdoor Shakespeare theater, 1,100 mm. seats. Oh, and wow. that was a great education to learn how to use my body in that space. Mm. And I did that for almost four years. And mm. I was transitioning to Chicago and... Yeah. Um, and I was you, perfectely content doing theater in, yeah. in Chicago, Milwaukee, and Madison. But then you were introduced to the Steppenwolf this community. I had auditioned for them. Erica Daniels, who at the time was the casting director, had been my judge at the Erda auditions when I got into grad school. I didn't know that. I didn't know judge. anything about Steppenwolf Theater at the time. I didn't uh, know who they were. Again, ignorance is bliss. You, know, sure. you don't know what to you be scared of. You know how big of. a deal it is, yeah. And so she, when I got to Chicago, she was lovely about calling me in all the time. Oh, so cool. I, got, I, was, I was called back a few times, and mm. it was, wasn't until Honey that I really... But I didn't come up through the Chicago scene. I really came mm-hmm. up in Wisconsin. And I only did, you know, I did one play at a place called Remy Bumpo that was a small play called Bronte, about the Bronte sisters. Mm. My second play was at the Goodman, and it was right after Anna Shapiro had won the Tony Award for August Osage County. And my third play in Chicago was Virginia Woolf. <laughs> and then I had an 18-month and break before we went to Broadway. And I met my husband. <laughs> and I kind of then went worked backwards and did two or three plays while we waited to go to Broadway. Oh, right. In the storefront scene, but yeah, I didn't. All over. I am not a. I don't. Didn't take the traditional path through Chicago. No, and, and it does seem really rare to be yeah. 
doing regional theater and to make to make a living off of it mm-hmm. and to do mostly your passion yeah. to pay the bills. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally rare. I mean, what is your advice to those who are trying to do it? <laughs> Save your money. Okay. Save your money and learn how to cook. Be smart about money. I learn always how to cook. tell them because I, I was in, when I was in grad school at Madison, I was a TA, and I made $9,000 a year, and I did not take out wow. any loans. Oh, wow. And I was only able to do that by, like, cooking chili on Sunday wow. and freezing it in some paper cups yeah. and eating it for a week. Wow. And, you know, I got an IRA when I was 21. Mm-hmm. I always put a percentage of my paycheck into savings. My, my father taught me this stuff when I was really young. Oh, okay. and, and unfortunately, a lot of young people are not taught these strategies, uh-uh. and you got to figure it out because otherwise your artistic choices will always be beholden to your checkbook. Right. And you don't, you don't want to have to do that. You want to be able to say yes to this passion project because— you know, you know you're going to be able to eat for a couple weeks yeah. if you do it. And and also because it's a gig economy, you're going to have lean times. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's going to, you're going to be flush and then you're going to be broke. And you have to be able to save money during those flush times mm-hmm. to get you through the lean times. And for me, that's, that's, that's the biggest obstacle, I think, for mm-hmm. some artists who are trying to excellent. be artists. It's very practical. It's but, so practical. And then, you know, do your work. Memorize your lines, you know. Right. <laughs> Be prepared. That's, That's the, the stuff obvious that comes one. after the yeah. getting the practical stuff out of the way. And yeah. I think a lot of actors, um, maybe a lot of people, maybe myself included, <laughs> <laughs> numbers and money and all of those practicalities are like, I don't want to think about those mm, things. Better figure it out. Totally. Because mm-hmm. then you can get to the stuff that's important to you. That's right. Yeah. And just the peace of mind. You know, when, you mm. are, when you're stressed out about money problems, oh, yeah. you can't concentrate mm. on your work. You yeah, can't. Totally. It's impossible. Just yeah. like a marriage. That's why that's the number one thing that ends in marriage, you know, mm. is money trouble. There's a reason. Yeah, yeah. What about the audition room? What is your advice for that kind of realm? <sighs> this You've is going to sound a really, fair amount. really cheesy. It's uh-huh. funny. I do it less and less now. It's so right. interesting as you get more successful, you, you get further with, away from that yeah. skill set. Yeah, you have meetings you now. Meet with but um, David. The thing I discovered, so I had, I started doing commercial auditions in Chicago, and I was really terrible at them for such a long time. But that's that kind of how I learned how to be on camera. On camera, yeah. Because in Chicago, the market is smaller, so you can go in a lot. Oh. And I and I started to book a few things, a lot of moms. moms. But what I started to realize, and this translates to theater or film, hmm. it, it's so it sounds so abstract, but hmm. you you have to bring your love into the room. And what I mean okay. by that is. What you're doing is an act of generosity. You're coming in to give something to people in a room. Cool. Something that you've prepared lovingly for this moment. And if you come in with the attitude of that sharing yeah. and that openness and and practice, you know, breathing and being present in those moments mm-hmm. where you're really looking at everyone, mm. then you're not worried about yourself. Mm. Because if you're worried about yourself, then you're not doing it. Yeah. If you're um, self-conscious, right, and instead, when you when you get to be present and in inside of love, then you get to be with the person who's in front of you. Mm. Now it's harder, I think, when you're doing a monologue to no one. Yeah. But most of the time now, you're doing a scene, and uh-huh. so you have a scene partner. Yeah. And you can you can start to hook into how you how can you appreciate that person. Even if they're terrible, and even if they're not say, looking at you. Or even if the writing is terrible. Yeah, even yeah. if the writing is terrible. Okay. The, the only thing you have then is your presence mm. there. Yeah. And it's much more satisfying to do it that way. Yeah. It's very hard to... It sounds really hard because if it's all, if everything is terrible and you're having a terrible day and you're not feeling in your body and in your mm-hmm. and you're not feeling your presence, you, you still got to try to get into that, right? I guess as the older I get, the more mm-hmm. I realize that those circumstances that you describe about like the day you're having before yeah. you go into a room, those are an illusion. Oh. So oh, <laughs> we're getting pretty woo-woo here. Yeah, this um, is great. In the moment... Everything is fine. Uh-huh. Any stress or preoccupation you're having comes from either worrying about the future mm-hmm. or obsessing about the past. Uh-huh. And the moment is fine. Yeah. It's always fine. And so I think the work of an actor is actually about stillness mm. and finding space in your mind and your body where those automatic thought processes aren't kicking in anymore. Right. Now, as a young person, it's impossible. But you yeah. can start doing that work right now. Uh-huh. 
You can meditate five minutes a day. I know meditation is a big thing right now, but the reason it's a big <laughs> thing is because it's real. Yeah. Because what you start to, if you sit quietly with yourself, what you start to notice are your patterns mm. of thinking. Oh, cool. And when you start to spin out, into the future because you don't want to think you don't want to memorize mm. your lines right now right mm. and then you get to you get to say oh there's that thing i do yeah where i'm thinking about that yeah and then you just come back to the moment which is fine yeah and that's the work in that room is to try to get how do you create space for yourself so no matter what's happening mm. you can be centered and go into a room and be very present that's the work you can kind of recognize the traps you might fall into mm-hmm. or the patterns or the yep Roadblocks. Yeah, you your monkey set mind. Up for yourselves, your monkey mind. Yeah, it's your monkey mind. Yeah, you have no control. <laughs> right. But you do. You're fine, actually. Um, that's terrific advice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. And because I can't resist, and because you mentioned the thing about monologues, like it's true that they're kind of rare, mm-hmm. and sometimes you don't have a scene partner, or you mm-hmm. kind of have to respond to yourself almost. Yeah. But specifically maybe like using uh-huh. the last scene of the leftovers ever the series finale the last yeah. scene as an example mm-hmm. I, I you delivered this big long speech directly to justin mm-hmm. in a very tight frame mm-hmm. but how how on earth do you <laughs> tackle a monologue like that and how do you do it again and again and again and is it about of course it's about the breathing sure but is it about listening to him mm-hmm. is that a, a crucial crucial part of it is that how you find the inspiration to mm-hmm tap into something that was so magical. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, the approach, you approach it, I approached it like a play in that I had to memorize this thing so thoroughly that I wasn't thinking about what was coming next. Mm -hmm. And luckily, most of the time on The Leftovers, we wouldn't get scripts. We'd get scripts 48 hours in advance. Really? But fortunately, in this case, they gave me that one, so I had a few weeks to prepare. Cool. So I I knew I had to memorize it really solidly. I've recently gotten on to some auditory learning. Mm -hmm. I've been using Line Learner. I always thought I was a visual learner, and I am, but I think I'm actually quite auditory as well. So that's been interesting to listen to the lines while I do other things. Mm. So I did a lot of that. Cool. And then... The other thing that's important for me, because I've always thought I have a very intellectual approach to the work, one of the things that's important that's easier when the writing is good is the architecture of the story. So why mm. why does this word have to follow this word? And why does this sentence have to follow this mm. sentence? And why does it make sense that this paragraph has to come after this paragraph? Mm. If you build that um, logic in your mind, then you have a scaffolding for climbing through the story because cool. you know you know why you ha- why the next thing comes. Yeah. If you don't have interior logic for the the monologue, then you'll you'll get lost and you'll mm. forget what's next. And the the scaffolding allows you to stay in the moment because you don't have to anticipate what's coming. It just when you practice that logic, when you've mapped it out, then it's it becomes part of your memorization essentially wow. so you can sort of jump to the next thing in a way that feels more organic to thought just like we do when we're thinking mm. so you build that structure for yourself in the work hard to do with bad writing you have to do it artificially yes. and for yourself you gotcha. have to justify why something comes after mm. another thing luckily i've been very spoiled with good writing mm. so that's the next thing mm. and once you've done that then yes you're, you're present in the moment mm-hmm. and if you have seen partners like i have that person is listening to you yeah justin's a great listener mm. and you're you get to speak into that listening every time and if your acting partner is generous in the way that mine mm. are mm. they're receiving it and so it's easy to start to get self-involved and turn that back inside, yeah. but you have to s- remember that you're seeing if you're le- convincing someone. So yes. it has to stay active. That's your objective in that. Yes. In that scene, you were trying to convince him. Right, yeah. and so you, you know, there are takes where I would feel myself kind of because you're tired or you've done it four times. Mm-hmm. You start to recede from that action, and you you have to stay on your action. Mm-hmm. And luckily for me, I like again, my scene partner was somebody. Now, if your scene partner's shitty, then they're an obstacle, and that's okay too. Then you really have something to fight against, right? Because they're not listening to you, and actually, your Wait, action the actor becomes is the obstacle. Well, if they're not listening, and uh-huh. if they're if they're, you feel like they're not present, but or they're you can not, use that how because that's a, that's a huge obstacle. It makes you have to work even harder to get I their see, attention. To get what you need from them. Yes. Yeah, okay. So you can always uh, find an action, even yeah. in a bad actor. <laughs> yeah. But I had a good actor, so <laughs> I think speaking into the listening of somebody is really important. Justin was great at that. My scenes with Regina, I always felt oh my so blessed God. to have her. I know she's a she's an astonishing performer. Another one and, with intense close-ups where you're very oh, still. Yeah. And she's when I think about that so scene, focused I get full and so word perfect. <laughs> I, me too. I loved working with her. It makes me dizzy to think about how good the two of you are. Oh, she's so show. 
It's, We're talking she's to her next dream. week. <gasps> oh, will you tell her I love her? <laughs> yes. Yes. Tell her I love her. Spoiler I do. alert. I miss her so much. I, I, I was. That. She's so busy. She's so hard to pin down for, you know, a girly oh, dinner. Yeah. But I'm trying. I won't give up. But yeah, that's what I would say. Memorize. Mm. Do your architecture. And then you have to work on present. Being I present. love the architecture idea, especially because, like, I've heard that in terms of compelling on-screen acting, it is all about the connections between thoughts mm-hmm. and how to watching how a character gets there. Yeah, I suppose that's true because you know when when you don't believe it. Yeah, we know on a gut level. Yep. Yeah. And, and usually, if you go back and you look at a moment you didn't believe, I I promise you, mm. almost every time they're not breathing. Yeah, cool. We know it. That's the thing we're. Wow. I think that's the thing we're picking up on. Yeah. That audiences is that we're not breathing in a way that's real. The way humans speak. Amazing. Or think. Yeah. Because breathing is life, and if you're not doing it, then you're dead. Like yeah. you're. <laughs> you're right. You're not. You're not. You know, put, giving oxygen to all the things. Yeah. That we need. I've never breathed so much in an interview before. This is oh, really I'm great. Oh, I'm so glad. <laughs> oh, that's so good. This is so good. We brought it back to the where we started with mm-hmm. the breathing. Mm-hmm. Being the most important yep. thing. It's the most important thing. Totally. In any moment. Yeah. Is there any last w- words of wisdom for backstage or Gosh. listeners of this podcast? Oh, kids. What can I tell you? You are a fountain Don't of wisdom. Mm. Mm-hmm. Don't take yourself too seriously. Don't take yourself too seriously. Don't take any of this too seriously because it doesn't matter. Mm. We're all going to die. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to stop breathing. Yeah. So try to find some joy. Yeah. The harder cool. you are on yourself. And I was somebody who, I'm a perfectionist and I can be very hard on myself. Mm-hmm. And you have to learn you have to learn how to watch yourself and not sit in judgment. Because if you go onto a set you're intimidated by, if you're working with Steven Spielberg and you're just mm-hmm. intimidated waiting to happen and you're just scared of screwing up, mm-hmm. then you can't make choices. Mm-hmm. And so you have to be able to do the work of letting go of that judgment. And that includes being able to watch yourself because yeah. you learn you learn what your tricks are if you watch yourself. That's the only way to let go of your tricks. Yeah. I find that... I mean, I find it impossible to watch myself. You gotta. Yeah. I think you, I know that's, there's a lot of, there are many schools of thought on that. Yeah. But I think it's important because, you know, I remember watching season one of Leftovers and Gone Girl and seeing how much I was straining in my throat. Focusing on the throat. Yeah. And I realized I had to get back in and do some more vocal work to find some Mm. more ease. So Mm. I went and I worked with this magnificent woman named Gigi Buffington here in New York and um, I just discovered a new layer to my voice that I didn't have before. My voice is lower. After working with Gigi, mm. because I actually realized I was breathing high. I wasn't breathing all the way down most oh, cool. of the time. Wow. And so the only way I realized that was by watching myself and seeing how much I was working, how hard mm. I was working, knowing I was going back on stage and I yeah. wasn't going to be able to hit the back of the house without straining. Oh, cool. And yeah. that's the work. We have to yeah. keep trying, keep yeah. unpacking those habits and see why do we have them and how can we, mm. how can we let go of them so we have freedom yeah. to make a choice. I love that because it's both technical and philosophical yeah, yeah it is yeah it is both excellent thank you Thanks you are both having you me. did both of the things uh, i'll come back we anytime. got technical practicalities and we got grand philosophies about acting i'll write a book and i think oh yes you should <laughs> i think any <laughs> actors listening are going to learn how to be an actor by listening to this interview so oh, that's so you. kind good luck actors <laughs> hang in there break yeah. a leg yeah totally. breathe breathe just breathe breathe I love that it just, that's all it boils down to. I know there are all just kinds like, of posters with, you know, kittens hanging from branches <laughs> and stuff, but really, it's really the truth. It's really the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Ah, <sighs> yes. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you for guiding us on that journey towards spiritual awakening and toward acting prowess. And breathing from your (laughs) hoo-hoo. And breathing from your (laughs) hoo-hoo. I love that Carrie Coon is someone with a beautiful sense of humor (laughs) because you wouldn't necessarily know that from her very serious screen work. Um, I so loved talking to her and I can't wait to just continue to watch her think and react and feel on screen yeah, and on stage too. She's, she's coming to New York theater. So I'll be first in line, Carrie. Yeah. Thank you, Carrie, for bringing your wisdom. I'm so glad that she joined us. Shall we roll credits? Yes, let's do it. Okay.
Be sure to like, rate, and subscribe for more interviews from the front lines of the 2017 Emmy race in the Envelope and Awards podcast is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA in Los Angeles. Thank you, as always, to producer, editor, and all-around podcast wizard, Jamie Muffet. You can follow him at Jamie Music NYC on Twitter. You can follow me, Jack Smart, on Twitter at Jack Smart Writes. Thank you, as always, to the team at Backstage, the most trusted name in casting. That's Peter Rapoport, Ryan Remstad, Jesse Balashek, Francis Ramos, Mark Stinson, Rowan Alkatib, and especially, definitely, without a doubt, Casey Howe. For more awards and industry coverage, head over to Backstage.com. Thanks for listening. Tune in next time for another glimpse in the envelope.